to let people in. So we're just gonna uh, wait for a couple of seconds as people start to come in, but welcome. Okay, once again, everyone, we, we have started the recording, but we are waiting just a second till we see the numbers. I can see the numbers going up um, and I wanna make sure that we uh, uh, wait till we give everybody a chance to come in on the Zoom link. Okay, so we're gonna start now um, and there'll be other people coming in, uh, but I, I, I wanna say hello. My name is Liz Hume. I'm the acting CEO of the Alliance for Peace Building. Um, this is an ongoing session that we have on U.S. peace building. It started in May. Uh, we thought it would be six weeks max. Here we are in September. Why? Because these issues are complicated, <laughs> they're complex, um, and there's been a lot to talk about. We have focused in on what is driving the conflict in the U.S., what is, what are, where we're seeing um, good resiliencies, uh, and more importantly, what to do about it? What are the practical approaches that we can be working on it? So today we have a very interesting panel. I, I know it's also a controversial panel. So I really ask that people sort of embrace this and turn off your brain so that you're not automatically in that place of um, wanting to counter an argument. Um, our brains tend to go there um, and then we're not listening. So I'd really, uh, I, I want people to sit with this. Um, and, you know, some, uh, it might be uncomfortable at some times and that's okay. Um, it's okay to be uncomfortable, both um, on a more conservative side and also a more liberal side. Um, so, the title is what's the left got to do with it in terms of toxic polarization. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, our, we know the peace building field, the development assistance tends to be um, less conservative. Um, and this is a really important conversation. And I got the idea when, and, I, and we've been having these conversations, but I read um, Erica Edelson's article in August. Um, we'll put the link in the chat. And it, it, she's gonna go into more detail. So I'm not even gonna begin to try to explain um, um, the article, but it was one of those aha moments. Uh, and I reached out to other AFP colleagues and said, you know, we did a session on uh, um, right you know, Christianity and what does that, um, how, where, where are the challenges? Where are the opportunities? Um, so I think it's only fair that we ask the question, what does the left, what does the left have to do with it? Um, and so we have some fantastic panelists here today. Like I said, I, I already introduced Erica Edelson, read her stuff. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. I've read it a couple of times actually and sat with it. Um, and she's gonna go into more detail. Debbie Lynn uh, Molino, did I did I say your last name? Um, is uh, the co-founder extraordinaire on the Bridge Alliance. Uh, she she can introduce herself um, uh, and and her organization, but really working in this field and 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 figuring out how do we bridge uh, what's happening in the U.S. And she's also a membership based organization. Um, and a strategic partner of the Alliance for Peace Building. So welcome, Debbie Lynn. We're, we're excited that you're here. Steve House is with Braver Angels. And he and I had a conversation a couple months ago. Uh, and it was, it's, it's, it, was a, it was a great conversation talking about these, this subject as well. Uh, so this is who we have here. We have some great experts for you, people that have been doing this work, struggling with this work, and uh, I unfortunately am going to have to leave early. Uh, my colleague, Megan Corrado, will be facilitating the panel. Um, but I just, again, wanna ask everybody uh, to sit with this, think about it, uh, think about it some more um, and, and how the left is contributing. 
maybe it's the right thing based on the issues. Um, and also what is the work that the left has to do intra group, meaning what do we have to do? And I see this in my community as well, um, a very liberal community that I live in. And, and I see the work that has to get done amongst the liberal community. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna turn it over to Erica. And I just wanna say thank you so much. I really look forward to this conversation today. Great, thank you, Liz. Thank you so much to the Alliance for having me here today and to you all for coming. Um, let me start with the screen share, um, get that technical thing out of the way here. Let's see. Okay, can you all see that? Someone wanna? Not yet. Okay, sometimes it sometimes it takes a second here. You see it now? Okay, let yep. me go into, oops. My computer's freaking out, of course. Hold on, sorry guys. You might be able to see it, but my computer is flashing on and off. I call this the Zoom slowdown, Erica. <laughs> Erica, we can see it. Is your computer? Yeah, it's still, um, <laughs> it's still flashing. And um, oh my goodness, every time I try to go into slide show mode, every time I touch anything on my computer, it blanks out. Do you... Um... Uh, Megan, do you have the um, do you have the slide? Meg, do you oh. have the slide? Wait a minute. Can I you see I it just, now? Yeah. I think I just got it. So we're seeing an uh, an NPR reporter says Pompeo cursed. Is that? Um, no. Oh, did did are we looking at Megan's version now? Oh my gosh, is that I'm, okay? so, I'm so sorry for this mishap. Yeah, no, I guess. Um, Meg, I'll just, can you come on and tell us what's happening? Yep, I, this is my screen. Is that okay, Erica? Um, yes, except, wait a second. My computer is going so haywire right now that I am not seeing anything. Okay, sorry, I see, I see yours now. And um, yeah, I'm not even gonna, I actually made some changes since the one I sent you, so it's a little confusing. Um, Erica, you're also gonna... frozen. Do you wanna turn off your video? Is it, oh, <laughs> not you're back on, now you're not frozen. Okay. Okay, we are off to a great start. That's okay. I hope everyone's enjoyed my talk. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, it's, we're actually gonna, we're gonna skip over this slide and, and start with the next one in a minute, but. So I'm going to kick off the webinar with, with a short presentation of some of the examples that I've been compiling for the last few years of polarizing rhetoric coming from the left. Um, but before I launch into it, um, I want to just say that even though I'm about to be very critical of my comrades, I'm also very aware that there are really good reasons that people are doing this, really understandable reasons. I mean, trying to make change in this world of ours that has gone so sideways is really hard. And people are hurting. They're scared. They're broke. Um, they're stressed. They're exhausted. Like we're not at our best right now. Um, and most people, or probably everyone, has emotional baggage that can really intensify the need for admiration or, or even just the need to um, like fit in with a peer group um, or a political faction. And then it's also very natural to get triggered um, because of emotional trauma that we've experienced and that we still carry, um, or even, even emotional trauma in our, in our ancestors' lives. So all of what I'm about to critique is understandable and forgivable, even if it's also wrong and counterproductive. Um, so I'm gonna ask Megan to start just kind of running through these slides. Megan, kind of do it, I guess, at the speed you think people could digest it. You don't, I, I'm not gonna even give any commentary as we run through because I think they really speak for themselves. And as you're going through them, 
see if you can put yourself in the shoes of the people who are on the receiving end of this contempt and reflect on what they might be feeling. And Megan, I'll tell you when we get to the last one and where to stop. Okay, um, I think, did we lose Erica? I think, um, Meg, can you stop? I think we, did we lose um, record? Erica, you're back. Okay, I'm so sorry. Okay, no, so okay. These, are, these are all, these are not, okay, we're, we're sort of beyond the, the presentation now. Um, Meg, can you go back, please? Sorry about that, that. The last one was the, um, the dumb fuckistan map. Okay. Um, before the one before that. So, so what I, um, it looks like I'm still freezing up some. No, um, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So I, um, if people want to maybe just like put in the chat, maybe just like a word or two of like a, a reaction that you had, or, or maybe that you think people who are on the receiving end of this might've had. So Erica, I can tell you, I was watching the chat. What people were saying was, okay. oh my gosh, I've seen these. I know people who have posted these. Would mm -hmm. we be encouraging this in countries where we're working? Mm. So that was some of the, what, some of what I was seeing. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems so obviously unhelpful. Carl said, yeah, right. Exactly. So the problem that I have with these communiques, in case it's not really obvious, which I guess it was, um, is that they come across as self-righteous, condescending, abrasive, vindictive, and contemptuous. And they make the people on the receiving end feel a lot of really bad things. Um, first of all, people on the receiving end get defensive. When someone feels under attack, even a verbal attack, it's hardwired in the human brain to go into fight or flight mode. And at that point, all of the person's cognitive resources go toward defending themselves against the attack and their ability to take in new information, 
or process it or reason or empathize, all of that just shuts down. And the chance that someone in that kind of defensive state of mind can change their mind about something is basically zero. And then the other really bad outcome is that people might feel humiliated. They might feel resentful and they might want to retaliate or vote for someone who will. And so, so this is, next slide, please. This is what defensive looks like. One of the people that I interviewed for my book is a German psychologist named, uh, a social psychologist named Evelyn Lindner. And she said something I'll never forget, which is that um, humiliation is the nuclear bomb of the emotions. It is just so deeply wounding and hostility provoking. Um, and in her research, she came to the conclusion that humiliation was deeply implicated in the genocides in Germany, Rwanda, Somalia, and Serbia. So whether or not we're headed into a civil war in this country, or you know, maybe God forbid we're already in the early stages of one, I think the really crucial lesson here is that humiliation is a dangerous weapon to wield against half the country. There's no upside to it. It's it's just poison with no redeeming features. Um, the next slide, please. So this is a quote that I love from Lila June Johnston. She is a Diné Navajo water protector and founder of the Taos Peace and Reconciliation Council. And she says, we are dehumanized when we slip into hatred toward them. Our hatred for them is no better than their hatred for us. It is the same hatred. If I go into that same delusion that we're enemies, then I'm just as deluded as they are. And when I heard her say that a few years ago, it reminded me of one of my all-time favorite Martin Luther King quotes, one of many. Next slide, please. To retaliate with hate and bitterness would do nothing but intensify the existence of hate in the universe. Someone must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate. So these are two people, Martin Luther King, of course, and Lila June Johnston, who devoted their lives to social justice. And they had the wisdom to see that hatred won't get us to the promised land it won't bring us into beloved community. And so they call on us to lay down that weapon. Um, so I wanna shift gears now just for a sec because I know part of what we wanted to address today is um, toxic polarization within the left. So I've got just two quick examples. Um, these are from Twitter. I don't do Twitter anymore because it makes me so sad and crazy, but I, I got on just for this and um, these were literally the first two tweets that I saw. So next slide, please. So this one, I, I crossed out the names because I just didn't really want to call anyone out. But um, this first one is from a, a writer and editor for a lefty magazine. And she says, everybody knows that gifted kid programs exist solely to further entrench class race disparities in public schools, right? Do people not know this? So what I find objectionable here is that her tone is very smug and know-it-all. It's, I mean, it's overconfident, right? She's like one, clearly 100% sure that she's right. And then she sets up an in-group, out-group dynamic where you're either one of the smart, one of the smart set, the good guys who not only agree with her, but already knew it. Um, or you're a stupid bad guy who has to be schooled. Okay, let's look at the next one. So this one was aimed at the reporter, Matt Taibbi. He says, hey, Matt, does it bother you to have Trump won morons as your new biggest fans? So I thought this was a good example of a strong trend on the left right now, a very unfortunate one which is to root out and excommunicate the imposters. 
the people like Matt Taibbi who claim to be leftists, but they can't be because they occasionally say something that a conservative might actually agree with. And I, I just really think that we're wasting our time debating who is and isn't a certified leftist and purging our ranks instead of growing them. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there for now. That is the end of the presentation, Megan. And just I'll just leave you with this thought for now, which is that all of this vitriol and ridicule, I see, I see us shooting ourselves in the foot with it. If we on the left want to have our ideas heard, and if we wanna have our candidates elected, and if we wanna grow the ranks of our movements, then we shouldn't alienate people who don't already agree with us by being condescending and snarky and abrasive. And we also shouldn't be trying to one up each other with the intensity of our disdain for the other side, because all that does is create like a performative outrage arms race that eventually everyone is on the losing side of. Okay, thank you. So I will thanks. stop there. Thank you, Erica. Thanks. So I think I didn't do what I was supposed to do in the beginning. I talked about the fact that we were gonna go through a round of kind of what the problem is. And then we were gonna go through a round of, let's talk about solutions. So. Um, Debbie Lynn, you're next, and then Steve, and we're really focusing on what do you see as the problem, and then we'll move into a round of the solutions, and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, Debbie Lynn Molyneux, co-founder of Bridge Alliance. Um, my cat, Peter, looks like he's going to join the presentation today. Uh, he's a regular Zoom bomber. Um, un unlike my cat, though, most of the time that uh, that I spend in working in politics, uh, it's, you know, it's an unwelcome intrusion. Um, and, and part of this in-grouping and out-grouping that, out that Erica mentioned happens at such a massive scale that we, we barely have capacity right now. M many people barely have capacity to speak to somebody different from themselves. And so I, I look at it also as a, both a capacity issue, but also a maturity level. So how do, how do we increase our capacity to be uncomfortable, which is one of the reasons I was really glad to be here today uh, on this panel, but also how do we help each other have enough comfort that we can stay in the discomfort? So, in, so how do we not go into survival mode and, and, I, and I share that this is perhaps a survival mode issue too for the left, um, because my partner is one of those people that posted a lot of those memes on Facebook that, that uh, Erica ran through. And I finally asked him like, why do you do this? You know, what is the purpose of it? And when he sees something that he thinks is harmful for coming from the right, he is trying to, to fight it like in the moment, to dissipate that energy, that ickiness, if you will, from his psyche. And so he is actually in survival mode himself without realizing or recognizing it. And in trying to correct or school, he ends up doing the, all of the things that we know we should not be doing to build um, unity in our country and build a sense of, of social cohesion. Um, and, and he doesn't have very good trigger warnings. And so I think in our, kind of a collective consciousness, if you will, we're, we're about adolescent age uh, with not being able to, to hear other people as well and thinking that it's all about us. And so I just, I wanna, it's not everybody obviously, but there are some areas where uh, we need to do some self-reflection and, and increase our capacity, our ability to be uncomfortable and maybe grow up a little bit more. Um, so I'm gonna, Pause there unless you want me to keep talking. Because <laughs> in diagnosing the problem, that's my contribution. Thank you, Debbie Lynn. Steve? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Steve House. I've spent 35 years in healthcare. I've been fairly deeply involved in politics for the last five or six years, including a stint as the Colorado State Republican Party chairman. I've also been a Republican congress congressional candidate. 
I think the problem, and I work for Braver Angels now in strategy and partnerships, and the problem to me is twofold. One is we don't know each other. And the other is that because we don't know each other, um, we also have the ability through social media to tear people apart that we don't know. And that creates this important problem. And as part of that is we don't know why people believe what they believe. Uh, a very quick story. When I first went to a Braver Angels meeting, I had no idea what I was going to. It was a red-blue meeting. I was a red, of course. I was paired up with a blue. Uh, the gentleman's name was Roger. Roger stood up and said, I am a progressive liberal. I have always been that way. My parents are. My grandparents are. I don't like Republicans. There are no good Republicans. They have no good ideas, and I have no use, nor would I ever vote for one. Roger and I spent three and a half hours in structured conversation. He came back to the group and said, you know what? I was wrong. I know that this gentleman believes that we should do the same things or similar things to fix America that I do. We may go about it differently, but he actually is interested and cares about this country as much as I do. And Roger and I have remained friends since, and he voted for me, the only Republican he's ever voted for as a Democrat. So I think it makes things really possible if you get to know people, especially if you ask them why they believe what they believe, not just what they believe. So I think that we have an opportunity to go forward and do positive things, but I also believe that it's important that some part of our organization is working on post-American life, because if we don't fix this, there will be a post-American life. And I think, you know, Erica kind of said it, and I think that's something we have to be prepared for. I hope not, because I love this country and I love what we do here. And I came from a, a background of one of those deplorables who wasn't wealthy who, you know, made things work for me because of America, and I'd like to see it continue. So that's where I stand on the problem, Liz. Okay, thank you. Um, now we're going to do a round about, so what do we do about it, both individually and intra-group? Uh, again, individually, what can you do, but also what does the left have to do? And I know some people have talked about, we shouldn't be talking about left, right? I totally agree. Um, so what do we have to do, those that are finding themselves in this, in this place? Um, and with that, after this round, um, so we'll go Erica, Debbie Lynn, Steve, please also jump in um, you know, if you want to comment on something, and then Megar Crotto will take over. So thank you so much. Can, great, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry, I was having freezing problems again. Um, yeah, so I think I sort of got a two-track answer. Um, I've got my um, my braver angels hat answer, and then my hardcore left partisan answer <laughs> to this. My 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 bipartisan answer is, you know, I I really applaud the the work of um, that people like Steve and Deb and their organizations are doing to create forums where people can come together for a structured dialogue, because it can be much easier, I think, as Steve's story alluded to, to, you know, come to a facilitated discussion where there were, you know, there are some guardrails and there are some rules of the road. Um, and you're, and you're also sort of coached and given pointers along the way about how to have a more constructive dialogue versus, you know, just like sitting down with the person, you know, your relative that you disagree with every time you get together and you, you just go straight into your old patterns and it, it doesn't end well. So you'd be surprised. I was surprised how much easier it was to have a conversation across lines of difference in a structured environment. And I guess one of the upsides of this terrible polarization moment is there's been like an incredible uh, flourishing of groups like Braver Angels and um, and the Bridge Alliance um, and all these groups that are that are doing this. So check out different ones. See, you know, all of them have different formats. But if if you feel like you can participate in something like that, I would highly recommend it. And and I know that it's not for everyone. I mean, I know people who are just like not in a million years. And so fine, then, you know, maybe you shouldn't, like if you, if you feel that strongly that you would just go and make matters worse, then, you know, maybe it is best that you don't or, or that you just observe, like you could get on a, a Braver Angels national program and just be a, a silent observer. And maybe that's better. So I would, you know, participate if you can. And if you can't, which I totally get, then see if you can just avoid making matters worse by not spreading the kinds of things that I, I showed on, on social media. Don't engage with them. Don't don't like them. Don't retweet them. All that. Get off. 
social media if you can, to the extent that you can, or do less of it. Um, I promise you'll be, you'll be happier. I'm so much happier. Okay, then my partisan answer, because um, I, I love all this bridge building stuff, and I'm also just, you know, a dyed in the wool leftist, and I, and I really want to win, <laughs> and I want to have my candidates win, and I want to have my ideas put into practice and service. Um, and so I think some of the most exciting things that I see happening on the left in terms of organizing have to do with a, a deep canvassing model where people are getting trained to go into the community and door knock and have one-on-one -on -one conversations where they're actually using a lot of the same skills that are used in Braver Angels, um, but, it, but it's more toward a goal um, of like either an issue campaign or campaigning for a candidate. But, but it's like, it's deeper conversations. It's a lot of active listening. It's a lot of storytelling. There's, there's a lot of um, skills that go, go into it. And it's certainly not, you know, knocking on doors. I mean, no candidate in their right mind would do this and, you know, telling people that, you know, they, they were a moron if they voted for Trump and they better not do it again next time. Right. I mean, so it's like the opposite of that. And there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot, political scientists have been studying the efficacy of these various deep canvassing campaigns and kind of comparing the different the different styles and tactics and really getting some good data on what works. And so that's very exciting to me. I definitely want to participate in that. Um, an example, if people want to see an example, Megan, if you would post the Dave Fleischer TED Talk. Um, Dave Fleischer uh, um, runs the Los Angeles LB. LGBT leadership lab. And he was one of the early pioneers of this deep canvassing method. And he does this fantastic TED talk about it. And it includes some footage of an incredibly moving conversation be, um, in Miami between one of their transgender canvassers and you know the man in Miami who opens the door and you see parts of their conversation. And it is really inspiring and moving. Thanks, Erica. Um, personally and from partisan, I think uh, Steve already declared his uh, his Republican leanings and you're, you've declared your Democratic ones. Well, I'm the independent of the crowd. And um, I hang out with, with people from, from both sides, but I don't belong to either of the parties. So on a, a personal level, I think the thing that, that I have done that has been most effective is, is the deep listening. And I, you know, and I'm betting that a lot of folks on here that are, are listening to our program are already doing that uh, and managing my own triggers. Um, Erica, you, you mentioned like, if you can't uh, engage, you know, personally, maybe observe. And I think that's some, that's advice I've given people for a long time. Like if you can't listen to somebody who's different from you without being triggered, find another way to get the information. Don't participate, don't make it worse. And, and I have a personal pledge also about uh, social media because obviously uh, with a, a Bridge Alliance with 90 plus members, I'm on social media more than is good for mental health. <laughs> and, and I don't post anything on social media that I wouldn't see published in the newspaper with my name attached to it. So there's an element also of like asking a question of like, in this interaction that I'm having right now, what will I be proud of tomorrow? And if it's if I if my reaction or my interaction at the moment is not something I would be proud of tomorrow, I don't do it. And I, and I think that's kind of a really good standard uh, for interpersonal relationships is like, am I going to be proud of this tomorrow? Um, on a on the partisan side. Uh, Erica nailed it, you know, and Steve, you've alluded to this too with the, the great work that Braver Angels is doing. There are literally hundreds of organizations who are helping people train right now on how to be a better listener, how to engage, how to get to know people that are different from themselves. And uh, citizenconnect.us is the place right now where we're collecting all of those Braver Angels. You have all of your events, Steve, are already listed on Citizen Connect, but there are another 420 organizations that offer some level of event or on-demand content that you can find uh, through Citizen Connect. And so, and if you listening have events or uh, on-demand services that you can provide, uh, they can get listed on Citizen Connect. 
I think the, um, the fr friends and family thing that you brought up, Erica, was also really interesting because we all have, you know, th that the black sheep of the family that's different from everybody else or a, a faction of the family that's different. Like this is impacting all of us personally. And living room conversations pu put in, um, put up a friends and family tip sheet of remembering that the, that the relationship is more important than the political point. And, and to know when to pause and, and tell somebody how deeply you care about them and that you're gonna come back another day. You're gonna like end that conversation because it's, it's too triggering. Uh, and so I'll post that in chat because I didn't send it to Meg ahead of time, but I'll post that in chat for anybody that wants his friends and family tip sheet. Um, it's, a, it's a really good one. It's a really good one. So be proud of yourself in all your interactions. Don't do anything that you wouldn't see published in the newspaper with your name next to it and learn how to manage your own triggers. Okay, thanks Debbie, that's great. I, uh, I appreciate your independentness as well. Um, solving the problem, a couple of things. Number one, um, I've had a chance to participate in a couple of workshops that were depolarizing within. So it's either depolarizing within the party or depolarizing within the family. The fact that Thanksgiving is now what on average 18 or 20 minutes shorter than it used to be because families don't want to wander into politics or religion and they and they shorten their Thanksgiving to make sure it doesn't happen. That's that's a tough one. Um, but I'll, I'll a nod to Joe Lipinski, who was commenting in the chat about it's not about politicians in Washington because it's not. Um, that's part of the problem right now. I think what we see is um, you got to fix this at the grassroots level. You got to fix it at the door-to-door -door level, like what Erica was talking about in her book. Um, and part of the problem we have, and if you don't realize this, for when you run for Congress, you, you get to this. The people who run Congress today on the left and the right, the people who run the Senate on the left and the right, all come from uncompetitive districts in America. So they can be as polarized and as partisan as they anyone wants to be because there's no way for them to lose. You know, they, they gain money, they, they become have these big war chests, you know, Kevin McCarthy, Nancy Pelosi, you know, Chuck Schumer and uh, Mitch McConnell, no one will ever beat those guys until they want to go down. So we've got to figure out how to solve the systemic problem we have as well. And depolarizing the family, I think is important. But first, you got to start with sit with a group of people that are on the left. And I think the right needs to do this as well and say, what stereotypes do we have about the other side? And what stereotypes do we have about ourselves? Because when you start talking about your own stereotypes, it, it's funny in a way, but it really, really makes anxiety happen. And I've seen this done more and more. You got to have that conversation within your own group rather than having a simple echo chamber that posts the same things on social media all the time. Thanks. Thank you all. So tagging in here for Liz. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Megan Crotto. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy with AFP. Um, loved all of those comments. Um, just from the group level and the individual level, making, you know, sort of checking ourselves in our daily interactions with folks is so important because it's so easy to, to you know, retreat to our tribes or our political um, allies and sort of echo exactly what you said, Steve, just, just be an echo chamber. Um, so I wonder if you all could give us an example. Um, Steve, you kind of alluded to one earlier with um, your, your Democratic colleague. But how can we, you know, give me from your experiences um, a concrete example of a successful conversation or engagement or some, some interaction in which you were both very far apart, whether partisan or otherwise, that you were able to come to some common ground? And how can we, you know, what lessons can us listeners glean from that? I can start off if you want. So folks who, who follow me on Facebook um, know that I have a Trump supporting friend named Inga. And Inga is, is a long-term friend of mine. We've known each other for more than 20 years. Although, you know, I know I'm not that old. Um, and she regularly posts like all the stuff that, um, that the right wing echo chamber says. And about, I don't know, two weeks ago or so, we've been going back and forth on Facebook for a while, usually me asking questions and her, you know, providing the talking points. A couple of weeks ago, I just decided to pick up the phone and call her. Like I could see she was online. We sometimes private message each other. We'll say, hey, my media sources are telling me this. What are you hearing? And she'll, we share stuff that way uh, off, off the public, out of public view. But I just picked up the phone and called her and she was so 
warm and friendly to talk to, despite what the appearances are on the Facebook page. And our conversation meandered, and she's really concerned about the, the immigration crisis at the border right now and the people that are dying and that terrorists are going to get into the country. And she's watching a lot of YouTube videos. And then our conversation would meander away from that and back into talking about dogs or what she's what's happening in Fresno, California, which is where I used to live. And at the end of the conversation, I was just so struck by and reminded that she has a really good reason for everything she believes. And this gets back to your point, I think earlier, Steve, that she she's a smart woman. She knows what she's about. And for me to say that she is dumb or stupid because she echoes right wing talking points that I think are are BS sells her short. And, you know, I know that Inga will be my friend for the rest of my life, no matter what, because friends come first. That's great. I, I would share two quick stories to go with that, uh, Debbie Lynn. One was, first of all, I have a, a longstanding now relationship with the former Democratic state chair in Colorado, Rick Palacio. He, he and I have always gotten along because we had the same goals same. in mind, which was a fair and honest approach to elections, et cetera. But the two one-on-ones I had, one was with a 34-year-old former New Yorker, now in San Francisco, self-progressed or professed progressive liberal um, young woman. And we got into one issue that she was really, really stressed about, which she said she wanted a single-payer healthcare system. And I said, why do you want a single payer healthcare system? She said, a friend of mine had a lump on his arm, like a tumor, and he didn't have health insurance. So he cut it off himself and stitched it up. And I said, um, Rachel, do you realize that in America, we have something called EMTALA laws, which means that he can go into any emergency department anywhere in the entire United States. And he, they would have done that for him. And she said, no, I didn't know that. And she said, I wonder what else I don't know about healthcare. And I said, well, maybe we should have a healthcare conversation. And by the time we got done, we agreed that we both wanted America's healthcare system to be better. It needs to be better. People need to be healthier in this country. So those kind of things happen when you ask why someone believes something. The second one real briefly was, I was asked to do a one-on-one -on -one with a man in California, a gay man. He was representing the LGBTQ community. And he wanted to tailor the conversation. He, he sent it to me. He wanted to talk about sexual preference and some of the other issues around it. And we started out by him saying, you know, tell me why it's, he said, I'll tell you why it's cool to be a gay man. And, you know, I've got lots of family members who are gay. We had a very fun conversation. And I said, he said, okay, so tell me why it's cool to be a heterosexual. And I said, it isn't cool to be a heterosexual. I never think in those terms. I don't even, I, I mean, the definitions that you use in your daily life, I don't know what they are. And it's not because I'm a dumb Republican. It's just not something that is top of mind for me. So what Eric and I learned, and we've continued our conversation is, is before we go anywhere in a conversation, we have to define some terms. You know, if you want to talk about nonviolent communication with a traditional Republican, they look at that and go, I don't know what that is. In fact, I probably won't have the conversation with you because I don't know what it is and I don't want to feel stupid. So make sure when you're talking to people that you agree on terms first so that then you can have a meaningful conversation and no one gets hurt. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I I, I think um, defining terms is is incredibly important, um, and it's it's always good to start a conversation by asking questions about anything that's at all unclear, rather than making assumptions, because you can make assumptions that end up leading you mm -hmm. in a very bad direction that you didn't necessarily have to go in if you if you hadn't taken that first step of defining terms. It's also something um, I, I talk about a little in the in the article that um, Liz referred to at the opening seven deadly sins of politispeak where one of the things that highly educated liberals and progressives often do is throw around like a lot of jargon um, that comes out of the academy or that's used a lot in activist circles but you start talking to ordinary people liberal or liberal or conservative and they're like what are you talking about so i think it's um good to avoid terms or if you have to use them you know define them but just be aware like Terms can lead you astray and also can, can really make you come across as like a condescending know-it-all when, when plainer language would have would have fit the bill. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share a story. Steve's story reminded me of, of a story that was also with, with my Braver Angels buddy, um, who is a, a Republican, Better Angels, also named Steve, different Steve. Um, and so this was a, a little over a year ago and it was after um, George Floyd was murdered. And Steve called me and he was, um, he wanted to talk. He was really upset. He was incredibly shaken by having seen it and was saying, you know, it's really time people like me wake up to this and I want to 
I really want to talk to all my conservative white friends about this. I think this is really important. He said, but I really have a problem about, you know, this defund the police. Like that really worries me. So I, I asked him, so he was running through my mind. Well, okay. So I, I asked, the question I asked him first was, um, what are you worried might happen if we defund the police? Now, if many of you are like me, your assumption is that he was, his answer was going to be, you know, crime. I'm just, I'm, I'm worried about more crime in my neighborhood. Well, his answer was, well, my mom has dementia and sometimes she wanders out at night from her facility and the police need to go find her and bring her home. And if the police aren't there for, to do that, what's going to happen? And I was just like, oh my God, I would not have guessed in a million years that that was going to be your answer. And, you know, I, I have people I love with, with dementia too. So I could totally relate to that. So we had this great conversation and then we talked more about defund the police and police accountability, but we built on this connection and it was all because I started with a question instead of just launching, which is what I usually do, launching into a lecture about the police and this and that. Um, you know, we started with a question that led to connection. Thank you for that. that that's so lovely um, to hear. And thank you to everybody who's dropping resources and tips in, in the chat. Please continue to do so. They're fantastic. And um, we'll save this and try to collate and, and distribute to the folks that attended here today uh, afterwards. Um, and just to answer a question in the chat, we will be, um, the recording will be available afterwards. Um, so a, a question I have is, and, and Steve, you kind of mentioned this earlier, that many of the folks in Congress live in very strong R, strong blue districts, they don't have a lot of opposition. I know, you know, in those communities, you can go days, weeks, months without talking to somebody of the other political party. You know, your neighbors tend to be the same as you are, um, especially when you get more rural areas. So how do we help folks at that level overcome sort of the biases and, you know, um, maybe attitudes that become entrenched just because they're not really, there is no diversity of opinion or discourse. Um, what can we do to sort of do outreach and 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 just share ideas and and respectful conversation um, moving forward? I, I think one of the ways you can do it is you can use social media, right? I mean, you can actually put high quality questions or thoughts out on social media. I think the one thing that helps me to do is that um, I'll run into a concept, right? I mean, I'm on a COVID task force. I have been for 18 months because I'm in healthcare. And I'll run into a concept where someone will say something and I'll go, first, you know, I, I have this sort of trigger in my, in my heart that says, don't think whether they're liberal or Republican first. Look at the actual question or comment. And then um, before I'll comment on it or do anything at all, is I'll do some research. And I'll do some research across a broad range of available sources so that I can try to come down to the truth. And then quite frankly, if I can't quite figure it out, I'll often call somebody who's a liberal that I know and say, what do you think about this? I mean, I've done enough one-on-ones with people that are liberal. We kind of all talk to each other just to ask the question, what do you think about this? What's your opinion of this? And that part of that's, you know, being at Braver Angels, we're fairly balanced in our leadership team, Red Blue. But I think for the everyday person, you know, seek somebody out who's got a difference of opinion, ask them why they believe what they believe, and it'll help you mold how you respond to things. So if I can push back a little bit, I think on social media, the challenge is oftentimes we tend to follow folks that are of our same ilk or, you know, believe the same things we do. So you kind of get into that echo chamber of just kind of seeing things um, amplified. And, and to Erica's presentation earlier, we live in this ridiculous meme culture. And then that's how people are expressing themselves very much so, and, and obviously it can be really hurtful. Um, so how do we make sure that we're, um, or, or what tips are available to folks to sort of, to, you know, especially if you're in a, a far flung geographical area, or maybe you don't have access to, to lots of different folks, but you can be on social media, you know, how can we encourage them um, to engage with folks that have different ideas? Your point is interesting because, um... I was in rural Wyoming this year 
And I've been in rural Idaho and, uh, you know, other countries in the world this year. And I think when you're in those rural areas, a lot of times they're mad at federal government. They're not mad at state government. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends a little bit on whether your challenges are with your state government or with your federal government or both. Um, I think people need to be braver. I'm not just because I'm with braver angels, but you know, the reality of it is, is that America's 245 years old. The average democracy lasts 250 years. If anybody thinks that we have five or more years guaranteed, I don't think they're right. I think that, you know, the you know, post-American life could be four or five countries in that um, dumb fuckistan, excuse my language, that Erica showed on that slide. You know, there could be four or five countries there because we just stop agreeing enough that we split it up. I hope that's not the case. But if you care about the country being one country, then you probably need to be brave enough to find somebody to have that conversation with. I, th I think the question here um, becomes, do we, do we love our country enough and more than we dislike the people that we think are different from ourselves? And, and if you spend any time like with the courage to go out and meet somebody different from yourself, I mean, those of us who've done that, we know like, no, I have something in common with every human being on the planet and sometimes with the other species too. And, but until we go out and have the courage to explore that, we don't know. We don't have that personal experience of it. And so my question that, that I think about a lot is do we love our nation enough? Do we love our nation more than we hate what we think those other people are than we hate othering? And it really is a case of loving, love, loving courageously to, to move us forward. Um, I had something else to say, but it'll fly back around. Erica, I think I interrupted you. Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, I, I was thinking Megan's question about how hard it is to like even find people to, to talk to um, in certain parts of the country. I think that's true. Um, and But I think it speaks to kind of this much bigger problem, too, that that we have of the kind of the um, erosion of our civic infrastructure, where like the only, sometimes it seems like the only institutions that even exist anymore are overtly political. And even things that were once not political, like the PTAs are getting political because you know now they have to like debate critical race theory and things like that. Um, so I feel like there's a real like anemia in a lot of communities around the things that used to bring people together just in daily life, um, community centers, interfaith gatherings, um, bowling leagues that I'm thinking about that book bowling alone that came out in the nineties about the, the demise, the, kind of the breaking of the social contract and the demise of our civic institutions. And I, think it's probably only gotten incredibly worse in the 30 years since that book came out. So, you know, I don't, that's not, a, that's not a simple fix, but I, I do think that those um, kind of local community institutions really need some, need some investment. By the way, Erica, as somebody who's been deeply involved in politics and coached candidates, the most political office you can hold in America is running a homeowners association. So be careful with that. <laughs> so oh. <true. laughs> nobody should want to do that my husband just quit after five years he had enough he was done <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh I, I you know i'm just really i'm really struck by um in in talking about solutions there's kind of multi-levels of solutions uh, going right now there's the interpersonal work that needs to happen there's the inter intra-group work that needs to be done there's the intergroup work that needs to be done. And here I'm speaking all this jargon, right, Erica? Erica? <laughs> and then there's the, the inter and intra community work that needs to be done. Um, if any of us think that, you know, one of the things that I have seen shift in the last, I wanna say two years, has been a move from thinking that we can do a top down uh, solution for this. Like if we just get our leaders to act better, that that's gonna work. And instead the shift has been thinking, no, we actually need the grassroots. We need to provide tools and training to the grassroots level so that we can train up and we actually expect our leaders to be better. And, and we re instead of having leaders that are like rulers, which is the authority that we're all kind of resisting against right now, we need to have servant leaders um, that serve the public and they remember that we're the boss and we need to remember we're the boss. 
So we no longer expect our leaders to be purists um, or um, sell or sellouts. I mean, that's kind of what we've devolved to at this moment. And, and I hear Steve's warning very clearly. And it's you know part of why I've been working so hard for the last 15 or 20 years now. Deb, so what can, I'm sorry, Steve, what can I'm just we- make one quick comment. There, okay. One of the interesting things I've run into um, on that line, Debbie Lynn, is um, I've been working with members of Congress through a couple of groups, Faith and Law and Issue One, One's Right, One's Left. And um, they actually consulted with Doris Kearns Goodwin, who's a historian, right? She wrote uh, Team Arrivals about Lincoln. And you know what they determined is they determined that in Congress today versus what it was in, say, the early 80s and 70s, their families don't live in Washington, D.C. anymore. And so they used to live in D.C. together. They used to go to dinner together. They used to interact with each other. And she describes a time, you know, yeah, that 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 time was a time in which things worked better. But it's the same recipe today. Right. If it's not there, then, you know, do it in your local community. I mean, get people together and have a discussion. If somebody voted for Trump and you're an ardent um, leftist, don't just mock them for that. Say, why did you vote for him? Try to figure out why they voted for him. You'll find out a lot of people vote for particular candidates over a single issue. And you may or may not agree with them on that issue. You may not like the outcome, but you got to ask people why. You got to wander and be brave enough to do that. Yeah, that's a great point. So just picking up on your point, Deb, about grassroots messaging. What are the messages we should be saying from the community level? How do we actually get you know, the folks in Congress or with the big microphones, both literally and on Twitter and social media, how do we get them to change their behavior to, to help sort of foster some more civility? There, there are many theories of change that are, that I think are at play right now. And, uh, and I'm just going to like run through three of them. Uh, and there's not any, and I just want to start with saying not any one theory of change is the right one. I actually think we need all of them because they're pushing different levers right now. So uh, the one, the local, the local focused lever, if you will, or, or theory of change is a thousand flowers blooming. So there's a lot of independent actions. There's a lot of people in this nation that care about it. And a lot of folks are going out and starting their own organizations or projects to help. And most of those are focused in local communities. They need support, they need training, they need capacity building, uh, they need a platform. You know, and that's part of, of what Citizen Connect is designed to at least give them a place to put events right now and provide on-demand resources. But eventually, you know, we also need the training and that's what, you know, Steve at Braver Angels, uh, the, you guys have chapters all over the country and we're so glad that you're part of both Citizen Connect and Bridge Alliance because, you know, you, you're doing the work. There's other uh, organizations out there that are, have do-it-yourself models like Living Room Conversations or the Listen First Project that that hosts an annual National Week of Conversation. All of these are designed to support the theory of change of a thousand flowers blooming. The second theory of change that we see comes in the, with the reformers right now. And these are the folks who wanna change the way we, that we vote and the way we elect people and who can be on the ballot. And so they're kind of, I call these the engineers of democracy or the technicians of democracy. They really wanna fix the, the structural things about um, making the primaries more open so more people can vote, encouraging people to then vote in the primaries so we get less extreme candidates, uh, concern about redistricting uh, and, and being anti-gerrymandering so that we don't have as many um, uncompetitive districts as we do now. And so, th so that's another theory of change that if we just fix the structure of our voting and electoral system, things will shift and the, and the uh, elected officials will be more responsive to the people. Campaign finance is wrapped up in that too. And then I would say the third theory of change that I see out there right now is what I call the grand strategy. And this is much more of an elite and top-down approach where because this is such a complicated and complex issue of self-governance and how do we do self-governance in a healthy way in our nation, there are the money right now is not flowing into this bridging or peace building work domestically because there's not a grand strategy that funders can understand and be reasonably sure that their, their investment will have impact and the impact that they personally would like to see. 
So there's this also that, so this theory of change that we need a grand strategy that will combine all the movements together to get us to the finish line and save democracy um, is a third theory of change that I have yet to see um, really develop or produce any new funding beyond what we already have. So that's kind of my big broad overview right now. There's on a way in there, how we can change behavior at the top. Uh, well, that was that was incredibly comprehensive, Deb. Thank you. Um, I I have a, maybe like just a little bit of a, a sideways addition to that, which is that I something I've been becoming much more aware of. You know, having been politically active for many many years, but I'm kind of ex trying to reexamine like if my activism is coming from a place of elitism, and whether I'm getting on board with issues that seem really great and progressive and why wouldn't everyone love this, but are actually truly the priorities of like educated white liberals and don't have enormous amounts of popular support or maybe have some support, but are not necessarily the priorities of everyday working people. And so I think, um, you know, I think as activists, we have a responsibility to do a better job being bottom up, like putting the putting the grass, putting the roots in grassroots um, and really listening to what non-activists priorities are instead of assuming we know. The one thing I would add to that um, point, Megan, and to what both Debbie Lynn and Erica said was, I think we have a big problem figuring out what the real problems are that we should have worked on. Um, you know, there's an infrastructure bill, it's, you know, a whole bunch of money and yeah, people drive on crappy roads and yeah, we have some plumbing problems and all that others. But, you know, if I sat down with the people, I'm near Detroit right now in the community of Detroit, they would say 9% of their students graduate from high school and are competent in math. That problem is so big of a problem. I, I would think that would take priority over almost everything. You know, 80% of the people in this country, the average 80 year old in this country has lost 80% of their lung capacity. That's why they're dying from SARS-CoV-2. Um, those are problems that are just huge problems that the political infrastructure in this country should be taking on. But yet, I think what we do is we take on the whatever political issues give us more political power or, or enhance our position. And I think from the grassroots level, we've got to knock on their doors and say, hey, wait a minute, I want to know how my kids are going to get better educated and compete on a global scale and have better lives. Steve, yeah. to, to a question that I often ask um, of, of my friends who work in politics, and that is, politics is a game of power, but it's power for the sake of what? Yeah. And if it's to hoard more power, you know, that's not a good answer. Let's get those guys out. <laughs> or women, not to be sexist. It's interesting because I, I do humanitarian work in countries in Africa. And, you know, I've talked to the, you know, the people in Kenya who run the country of Kenya, for example, and, you know, it's, it's so divided. I mean, one or 2% of the people have all the money and 3% have all the money and they're usually political people. And for them, it's two things. One is I have to have that power because that's how I live the lifestyle I want. And secondly, the best way for me to have that power is either keep people uninformed or make them feel stupid. And those kind of strategies happen at local levels across this country at times too. We've got to fight that and start saying, look, if we're going to run a society, elect leaders who get the fact that they are elected by people who want certain things to be a priority, not what their power is all about. Um, just to go back to one thing you mentioned, Deb, about the three theories of change, and one of them is sort of the structural issues um, of our voting system. But how do you sort of break through those when, um, again, it's sort of entrenched gerrymandered districts, it's folks that are sort of um, amplifying things they're hearing from their constituents who are maybe hearing things from their other community members who are maybe hearing things from social media. So how do you sort of address that structural challenge of, of these, you know, crazy lined districts um, to sort of ensure there's more, and I'm not going to say moderate, but more um, diverse thought or priorities are articulated in Congress to, to get back to, you know, addressing the issues that Steve was raising. That's a tough one. Here's, here's, here's the truth, depending on you know, where you are in this country. There are three places in the country right now, an area of Oregon, an area of uh, Eastern Washington, and an area of North Central Colorado that have all 
considered and probably will put ballot initiatives on their ballots that will allow them to secede from their states to go somewhere else. And the reason why they're doing it is because they don't feel like they're represented well in the capital of those states. Um, that's an indication that, you know, we've got a structural problem with districting. The problem is without term limits or without something that forces people to act differently during their term in office, I don't know if it's a fixable problem. I might be a little too pessimistic about it, but I've been deeply in it and I don't see how we would do it. It's really interesting, this gerrymandering stuff, because it is it is actually one of the few issues with pretty strong bipartisan support saying we need to deal with this. Like you'll find bipartisan disapproval of gerrymandering. Um, so it's like, it's the politicians who are the problem here because it's benefiting them. They got elected in a gerrymandered district. Of course, they don't wanna give that up. Um, but, but I guess I, I'm a little bit optimistic just since, since it is, you know, since it does have mass public support that, that eventually will be able to force their hand on it. The numbers don't look good on that, Erica. <laughs> well, right, not right now, no. Yeah, I've they always, do. You know, for a decade now, I've always thought it was interesting when you pull people and say, um, what should we do with existing, you know, office holders? And they say, throw the bums out, right? It's like 92% say, throw the bums yeah. out. Um, would you be willing to vote against the person who represent you? No, 93% say no, right? So 92% want different people. They just don't want to replace the one that's representing them. So I don't know if we're ever going to solve that. On that point to bring in a question from the chat, um, can you talk about how polling can exacerbate divisions and how does it do so? So, so I'll go on a mini rant, if you will. <laughs> I hate polling. <laughs> I hate participating in polling. And part of why is because it, it forces a binary. And so it, when, when we're part, either participating in poll or reading a poll, there's generally speaking, unless it's a, a more sophisticated poll, it's a this or that option. And this or that is, is part of what got us here. It feeds into the, the duality of black and white thinking. So, um, there are some deep polling and deliberate, I, I actually really like deliberative polling. And that's where people read up on something, they have a conversation about it, and then they, they ha have a poll that has more nuance to it. Uh, American One Room did this uh, with some tremendous success. It's very expensive to do, but uh, that's the kind of thing I think we should be moving towards. I'm not a big fan of polling either, having been a candidate, run a party, um, I think America's Americans are trying to fight back by telling the pollsters something other than what they really believe. So polls are getting less and less effective. Um, they, they can influence. There's no question that they can influence the outcome of an election, at least somewhat by people's behavior. Um, I don't like that. I hope we can find a better way to do it. And, you know, the problem is, is that polling affects how much money you get as a candidate. If you're close in the polls, you get more money. So you go out and hire pollsters who will do a, a poll the way you want them to do it so that you can get more money because money drives politics. It's a self um, supporting loop that we're going to struggle to get out of unless something really changes. Again, I would just add that uh, most polling only happens with folks that have a landline still. So that sort of limits the scope. Um, you're seeing it slowly evolve, but for most, you know, for someone who's worked on campaigns before, um, yeah, it's, it's a yeah. limited audience, I would say. Um, just to keep, go ahead, Erica, did you want to jump in? Well, and also just, just to tack onto that, I've also um, seen problems where like it's severely undercounting Republicans generally. So their polls are skewing. Repub uh, Democrats and sometimes giving Democratic candidates a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, so just to, to feed in some more questions from the chat. Um, so for education and public charter school can be part of the process to improve education outcomes. Why aren't left-wing activities supporting rather than just keeping the status quo? Sorry, could you, could you read that again? So I think she's asking um, how, so why aren't why aren't left-wing activities supporting rather than just keeping the status quo? She wants to clarify that. So I guess, how about, how can school sort of address these issues of civility? I know some, some folks, I know um, AP working with um, New Gen is working on doing a peace building curriculum. 
in, in civic, you know, in our civics education. So what could we be doing, I guess, better at the middle school, elementary, high school level to sort of prepare our next generation to really think about politics and policy in a, in a way that invites civility and, you know, good spirited conversations without sort of the polarization that we're seeing today. Are you talking about, do you think, are you, are you talking about Heather's question in the chat? Mm -hmm. I sort of built off of that. Yes. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I mean, I think what she's talking about is, um, so there's something called the secret shame report. It's usually produced in January and it talks about the disparities between white students, Hispanic and black students in the country in various cities around the country. And um, so you find these horrific you know, statistics about how education performance is. So why isn't the left supporting charter schools and other types of school models rather than just public schools? Um, I think it's an entrenched belief that, you know, teachers unions, I mean, I, I never, I would never run against a teacher union or, or, or be disparaging of it because that, those are teachers, my kids, those are my kids teachers, right? So I'm not going to run against them ever. And I think we make a mistake, but I think that what we have to get to is everyone saying the same thing, which is I want better education for my kids. I mean, you know, whatever the model is, you know, whoever's going to teach it, you know, if there's, you know, if, if the teachers union in Denver, Colorado, where I've spent most of my time came to me and said, I think we can change it and make it a lot better by doing something. I would listen to anything. And I think the left should do the same thing as well. We got to have better education, regardless, wherever it comes from. I mean, I, I'm sort of slowly waking up to this issue of um, some of the stuff that's going on in, in classrooms at the K through 12 level that I, that I wasn't aware of. And one of the wake up calls was um, my own son, when he was in um, eighth grade, he had a class, uh, an ethnic studies class. And, um, you know, I was asking him about it and he said he and all his friends, all of whom were, you know, like from progressive homes, they all referred to the class as, um, as liberal propaganda class. And I was like, oh my God, that is horrible because like, I'm looking at the curriculum for this class and it looks like great stuff. Like, I'm glad they're talking about this stuff, but it was that the way it was presented, it was clear to him that there was like one right answer. And if you, you know, said anything else or had a different point of view, you're going to, you know, you're going to be on the outs. Um, and I'm, and, and then building on that, I am seeing some surveys of students at the K through 12 level and in universities who were saying, you know, that they don't feel comfortable saying certain things, you know, that it's clear that certain things are not okay to say. And I think that's terrible because for so many reasons, but also because I just, I think that the left has fallen into a, a bit of a delusion in thinking that by stopping things from being said, that you're stopping people from still believing those things. I think those thoughts and beliefs that we really might not like, and, and, and I believe many of them can be very harmful, they go underground, they fester, people will, people will find another outlet. If they can't talk about it openly in their classroom or somewhere else, well, then they're gonna get online and then the alt-right's gonna be recruiting them. And it just, it just all can go in a very bad, direction. So I'd like to see more, more open. I think it's going to require training for teachers to um, be able to conduct those kinds of really hard conversations more productively. Yeah, education is a little bit out of my purview. Um, I can say that there's an organization uh, called uh, Education Reimagined that uh, grew out of convergence and Steve, what you were talking about, this has been the mission of this organization to figure out and reimagine what our whole entire education system looks like so we get an informed public. And, and Erica, to your point of, um, of, of being able to have those, in, those conversations and being able to process things in a group, a, a diverse group of, of a set of beliefs within a large group, that's part of the being able to be uncomfortable and increase our capacity to handle that discomfort that has been missing that I was pointing to earlier. Thank you for that. Yeah, so just to, to keep pushing, so how do we 
how do folks on the left, do they have an obligation to reach out with the folks that they don't necessarily agree with, or they don't really know what, you know, they think they might not agree on a particular thing. They might have a, a preconceived notion. Does the left have an obligation to do that in order to sort of, you know, rein in some of the um, rhetoric circling around? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's an obligation. I think it's just strategically wise, both, you know, for the, for the left to be more effective and for the, the, the future of our country. As Steve talked about, like we can't, we're not, we're not getting a divorce, or maybe we are, but it's not going to be an, an amicable one. So, I don't think it's so much an obligation as it's just it's in our interest to. Before the um, before the last election, there was a concerted effort made by Democrats to um, ask the 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 very left wing of the Democratic Party to be quiet prior to the election, to not criticize Biden for not doing enough, et cetera. Uh, and it was a strategic move, um, both, both from, a, a, from not encouraging Trump voters because Biden's being attacked also from the left, but really to get help Biden win and get Trump out. So there, there are, the parties are already playing that game a little bit. Um, it, it, of course, requires, and, and I don't know in the Republican Party, I'm less plugged in uh, into Republican politics, um, but there has been some attempt, I think, on the right as well to, to build a, a, a safe harbor, if you will, for those folks who did not support Trump within the GOP. So it, 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 it does behoove us. It is strategically wise. And what we personally do about it, I think, is, is where we are today. How can we do that for ourselves? So sorry to take it back into politics. That's just where I live. I'd be hard pressed to tell the left what to do because of where I come from. But the one thing I will say is um, we have to stop mocking concepts and ideas. Um, you know, we can't, and, I, and I'm not going to pick on her because I think she's fascinating. AOC wearing a dress that says tax the rich to a $30,000 per ticket event it's just don't wear the dress, right? I mean, you know, it's like you have to get taken more seriously. You can say the same thing about Marjorie Green and and on Lauren Boebert. They do really strange things that, you know, I look at them and go, just don't do that. I mean, because all you're going to do is you're poking someone in the eye when you do that. And there's no value in that, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and that was her point, though, Steve. She wanted, she wanted people, people to talk, to talk about, about it. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so from from that standpoint, it was it was interesting. It was an interesting tactic, but it's a tactic and I don't take it personally. I'm not offended by it. I don't know if any, you know, but I know plenty of people who were. Um, so, Chip, I don't know if we've answered your question well or not. Um, I have one more little spit bit on this, actually, that I just just came to mind. I was at a, at a meeting that was. Uh, largely a group of political peoples, a few artists, and a couple of uh, libertarian and conservatives who, who got invited in and they felt tokenized uh, as, as reported later on. But one, of the, but one of the libertarian guys stood up and he said, listen, if you people on the left don't reach out, then nothing's ever gonna change because we're not gonna reach out first. And that was really interesting. So Erica, just to support your kind of strategic alignment piece. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and I, I want to just go back to something I said, because I'm um, just for a, a moment of um, self-criticism. I noticed after I stopped talking that the way I had responded to the question about whether the left has an obligation, I noticed in retrospect that a little bit of um, condescension creeped into my tone um, when I said, no, you know, we're not obligated, right? Like as if what, what a stupid question that was. And so I really, I want to catch that and apologize to the person who asked that question. It is not a stupid question. It's not an obvious answer and my bad for responding in that manner. Um, appreciate the, the self-awareness and checking each other. And uh, that's, you know, what we should be doing, right? That's, that's kind of the, the message of today. Um, so we only have a, a few minutes left. I just want to sort of, you know, just get to go back on the AOC thing, just because it is sort of in the news. Is that helpful? It, it does get folks talking about her point and something she cares about really, you know, um, 
and have been quite vociferous about. Is it harmful to the left? Is it harmful to, you know, in that it sort of moves the conversation in a particular direction from maybe like the typical uh, agenda? Is it good because it is moving the conversation? And, and you know, you've seen a sort of a shift in, away from the center because of conversations like this. But is it is it good? Is it bad? And how does it sort of play into the divisiveness that we're talking about today? I, th I think I'm going to pull in a little Amanda Ripley here right now. So she has a new book out called High Conflict. One of the things she identifies as 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 instrumental to us being in this polarized place that we are with with the toxicity levels that we have is something she labeled conflict entrepreneurs. And so I think any time that we have um, we want to make a statement and make a splash to get people talking about it, we have to remember and take into account that there will be conflict entrepreneurs who take the intent and twist it and pervert it for their own use so that they can make a buck. And until we, the public, get tired of listening to the conflict entrepreneurs, that's always going to happen. The best thing we can do is ignore them. Right, for right now. Deb, my does, she have, does she have any sort of guideposts for how to sort out who is doing that in bad faith versus, you know, who really believes that what I don't, you're saying? I don't know. I don't have any contacts with AOC. Uh, no, I mean, um, no, I oh, mean, Amanda. Like, yeah, like how do we how do we discern who's being a conflict entrepreneur for self-serving purposes versus who's coming by it, you know, honestly? I I don't I don't know that she discerned that, but I would say follow the money. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a new way to market. It's on a dress, right? Um I, I think you know the real issue with it, you know, to be honest, is I find too often we use creative things like that, whether you like it or not, to offer a solution to a problem not well-defined. And, um, you know, having seen what poor really is, you know, both in this country and in, you know, places in Africa, um, you know, AOC might not have been appropriate either, but should have said support the poor as opposed to tax the, tax the rich, whatever the solution may be, right? I mean, it's, it's terrible that people are poor in this country and if you really get down to what poor means and you start talking about what they need, you know, let's let's deal with the problem. I'm not sure it starts with more taxes. It might end up there. But I think she should have said support the poor, not tax the rich. I think that would have been a better um, definition because she really would have said, you know, here's the problem I want to solve. Tax the rich could mean she wants a pay raise as a congressman. I don't know. Right. Say what we're for instead of what we're against, or especially who we're for instead of who we're against. Agreed. Well, yeah. It, well, and it, this gets it out of the blame game, uh, you know, and so there's so much of, of what's in politics today. If it's the if, it, if there is a blame game happening, we are stuck in the drama triangle and the drama triangle is the victim, the rescuer and the persecutor. And as long as we're in that that paradigm, if you will, of the drama triangle, we can't co-create something together. And part of what, Steve, what you just said in that little flipping of tax the rich to support the poor, we're focusing on what we want instead of what we don't want. And we're not blaming anybody for it. We're just saying, hey, let's do this. You did the same thing on education. So the, these, this reframe is something that I think the left could think a lot about and get out of the drama. I think the other thing that we can't forget is that, you know, cute little jabs aside, um, there are a lot of people in this country who think that 51% can govern the other 49. And it isn't true. It just is not true. I mean, you can't, you know, corral all your friends in and hope you get 50% plus one vote, and then you have power and you can make the other 49 do what you want to do. It doesn't work that way in America. You have to get a coalition of people um, that's beyond 50% plus one. And so therefore, make sure you act in a way if you want power, if you want to get your candidates elected, Erica, as you, you indicated, look for something beyond just 50% plus one vote, because you will never be able to govern even if you do get elected. Which is what we're seeing right now. That's correct. So given that we only have a few minutes left, let's let's take it back to the, the personal. And I know a lot of folks have been um, putting comments in the chat about 
you know, the challenges of interacting with, with their, their parents and siblings um, in, in their house, in their communities, in their uh, cities, larger, and beyond and beyond. So what are some good practical tips that we can use, take away today to have um, a more civil discourse and, you know, to be able to change minds, you know, there might be legitimate great ideas that somebody who, who you don't, you know, you've never thought about that perspective. So, you know, how can we sort of respond to the Facebook posts and Twitter posts and disagreements at, at the holidays um, and just kind of realize that we actually have more common ground than we were, we think we do if you only live on the internet. I think one of the ways I do it, Megan, um, I've come from a big family. They're not all, um, they're not all on the same page. I am. Um, I actually go into those conversations by saying, I'm going to have them teach me something. I'm going to do as much as I can. I'm going to go into it. I, I don't always have an open mind. I'm not, I'm going to be honest. I don't always have an open mind, but I want them to think I have an open mind because <laughs> if they then take the time to teach me, a, I'm probably going to learn something. It happens every single time. And B, we're going to bond in a way that we didn't before. I'm not going to be running and racing in my mind to figure out how I can tell them they're wrong. I just, what can I learn from them? And the one-on-ones we do at Braver Angels, and I've do, done a lot with, you know, liberal progressive Democrats. Um, I always go into those with the same attitude. What can I learn? And if you do that, I think you can at least start the basis start the for the conversation. conversation. I think that's great advice. Um, so in my book, Beyond Contempt, if anyone's interested, I do go into a lot of detail about a communication technique called powerful non-defensive communication, which I just you know think, think the world of. I think it's highly effective and recommend people tra train up in that technique. Um, but then as I was getting to the end of the writing of my book, I came, aqua I came across a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk and peace activist. And he said, speak the truth, but not to punish. And I was like, oh, okay. That's my entire book in seven words. Great. And that, that's really it. You can, you can say what you believe straightforwardly, but as long as you don't then cross the line and start tacking on insults and judgments and blame, then you've created the space for the person to at least consider your point of view not necessarily going to agree, but you're not foreclosing the opportunity of that. You're not foreclosing the chance of a meeting of the minds. I'm going to build on, on what uh, Steve and Erica said with just a short story from my uh, personal life. This was Thanksgiving in 2018, I believe. And my mom was visiting me. I lived in Oregon at the time. She was visiting me for Thanksgiving and as the visit was winding down, I was taking her and her husband, Chris, to the airport, and we passed this homeless encampment on the way to the airport in Portland. And Chris, you know, started talking about how these people just needed to go get jobs and, and the, the things that, that you all heard people say about homelessness. And my mom kind of popped in from the back seat. And she's and because I said, well, that's not necessarily true. Some of these folks, you know, can't work right now. And my mom said, well, what, what do you know about this? And it was the first time that I had that my mom, who's a conservative, asked me an open-ended question in such a way that I could share with her stories that I've heard from homeless people that I've talked to and help her understand that it's not just about lazy people not working. And so leading with the question yeah, uh, you know, I experienced the grace of that moment and a connection with my mom that didn't, that wasn't as deep before. And I know that when I've done this with other people, it has also helped uh, deepen our relationship in a new way. So lead with a question. I love that. Let's learn from each other. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much uh, to all three of you. I think we learned a lot. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Steve, I'm, I'm very nervous like you are. Uh, I, I do think the, the challenges are just absolutely tremendous, but you know, maybe having conversations like this, joining Brave Angels and Bridge Alliance and reading Erica's book, we will have some tools and opportunities to do the outreach and sort of multiply um, 
our efforts in moving forward. But um, just want to thank you again. Thank you so much to the folks who joined us and for all the great resources you dropped in the chat. Um, we'll ha be happy to put them together and circulate. And yeah, we look forward to, to getting back together soon and continuing this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.